Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, hey, hopefully you're doing well. And you are ready for today's show because today's show, fan favorite, all Linux show with Marcel Gagné. It's, uh, you know, it's always a lot of fun and I look forward to talking to him every single month about different topics that concern the Linux community and by extension, if you have not caught this show before all of us because all of us to some capacity use linux so everyone welcome into the program marcel waiting in the wings oh so patiently waxing his mustache and otherwise just uh you know ready to go but before we get to marcel first things first uh computeramerica.com that's where you'll find everything including the show notes marcel puts a lot of work into the show notes makes them look all nice and pretty and spiffy with links to everything that we talk about videos examples everything folks check those out why there be sure to check out some of our recent articles and reviews uh just last week we put up a review of a 17 inch uh faux faux suede tote laptop bag it was uh very very well reviewed uh by mobile edge check that out and we just put up an article on tuesday if you didn't catch that where we talked about the dark web uh not so much how to use it but just trying to demystify the dark web and uh and everything about it so Hey, check those out. Those have been, uh, you know, pretty successful. Happy that we put them out. And now, okay, why don't we go ahead and get started with our guest. So everyone, as I said before, he's a regular correspondent here on the program. Happy that he joins us every single month as our resident Linux expert. And uh, Marcel, thank you so much for joining us. How you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I am doing just dandy. And uh, yeah, no, I actually doing really, really well. Uh, people, don't, people don't know this, but before the show, I ran out and, uh, and got some goldfish. So we're going to see goldfish. what happens with those. Yeah. You know, those things only live about two years, right? Yeah, you know, you, you say that, but like uh, my, my, the last goldfish that I got was from the fair. And, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, how big the fairs are there, but, you know, they have those games where you throw the ping pong balls mm -hmm. into the yeah. bowls and get them. We had one that lived for six years. Uh, get out. Yeah, six years, and and he was happy. And then like a hurricane hit Florida, and the electric, or I'm sorry, the electricity went out for about two weeks, and his filter died. So uh, it took a natural disaster to kill that goldfish. But um, we have high hopes I, for these. I think that thing was a mutant. Six years, good God. Yeah, I mean. yeah. He, he 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 was a good goldfish. He was, but that's uh, that's neither here nor there. That's Marcel, happy. I know, but uh, yeah, so dead pets aside, Marcel, thank you for joining us. And uh, so before we get started, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and your background and uh, yeah, why you like talking about Linux? Um, well, I'm Marcel Gagne and uh, I've uh, been actually working in technology for, uh, for a lot of years, kids. It's <laughs> been a long time that I've been doing this. And, um, and specifically, I've been writing about Linux and open source software since uh, 1999. I've been using Linux since about 1992, which is actually about only about a year after it was released, because it was released in August 1995. Or sorry, 1991, August 1991. August 25th, 1991 was the famous uh, Linux email. And um, I'm just fascinated by the whole concept. Mm -hmm. Call got put on hold. Ladies and gentlemen, just one moment while we try to work to get Marcel back here. Oh, Marcel, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. We got put on hold for oh. just a moment, but okay. okay. I, I do not know what happened. I do not know what happened. Anyway, um, sorry, what I was going to say was, uh, yeah, I've been sort of fascinated with the whole idea of uh, open source software, particularly the idea that um, there is a way for people like literally all over the world to contribute to technology without having to have a massive investment in it. Now, granted, Linux is big business today. In fact, it's the most popular operating system in the world. And, um, 
and it's in everything. Like it's in your it's in your uh, thermostats, your television, your, uh, your car computer. Like I mean, it's everywhere. It's on your desktop. You use it every time you search for something on Google or buy something on Amazon or send an email to somebody or a chat message or something like that. I mean, you are using it constantly, even if you don't know that you're using it. So I'm just kind of fascinated about the idea that this is an open technology that's accessible to absolutely everyone. And, um, you know, and everybody can contribute to it and have access to the technology that lies underneath. It's kind of the, uh, you know, the, the level playing field when it comes right. to technological involvement. So I, I've just always been fascinated by that concept, the idea that all of us can contribute to this thing. So, um, so there you go. So I started writing about it in Perfect. 1999 and I've been writing about it and talking about it and, and, and making videos about it and doing TV and radio and stuff like that since then. So. And I'm yeah. still, I'm still keen on the whole idea. <laughs> and you still like Linux? That's uh, very, very important. I still and do. yeah, and, and and by the way, you know, just as uh, you know, the last place that I saw Linux, you know, kind of prominently was when it. I'm sorry, in my research for uh, that article that I'm going to draw attention to again about the the dark web. Um, yeah, we we cover these things called bridges that essentially um, where the the Tor or the the Onion routing net or the Onion routing network. Uh, they use bridges to essentially obscure people's, you know, identities and IP addresses and things like that. And at the very bottom of the Tor project, it's like, hey, do you want to, you know, learn how to run one of these yourselves? And they had a full Linux, or I'm sorry, a full Ubuntu distribution with everything set up, everything ready to go. All you have to do is download it, install it, run it, and you can, you know, you can start contributing to the Tor project by running a bridge. And they made it super, sim uh, super simple with their own distribution. I, I hope you pointed out to everybody that the dark web is really kind of boring. It looks amateurish, you know, like uh, like 1980s web pages and stuff. I like that. did I, I did mention that if people are used to the you know the, the World Wide Web, uh, the dark web is slow, it's cumbersome, it is amateurish, and it's full of dangerous stuff. So overall, it's really yeah, not something worth. It's, it's full of dangerous stuff. It's also full of like it's an awful lot of lame stuff on the, yeah, on the so oh, for sure. web. I mean, it's, it's the, the Tor project is interesting, by the way. Um, yeah, it is, it is a big open source project and it's actually important to a lot of people who rely on their personal security to be, um, to be masked when they're using mm. things on the internet. So it's, it's an exceedingly important project. So the whole dark web thing aside, right. that kind of ability to mask yourself either through VPNs or, or using the Tor network to, to uh, to you know privately and anonymously search the web or you know or work on the internet is actually very very important. So so it's a big deal. Now I don't know if you mentioned it when you were talking about the Tor project, but but uh, Firefox mm -hmm. has uh, just announced something like just a few days ago that they're working very very closely to integrate the Tor browser uh, anonymizing so, technology into Firefox so that it you know it's. It's so clean I, and fast and works smoothly. I didn't get into that, but I did remember that we covered an article, or we were going to, I don't think we even talked about it, but I was going to cover an article that Mozilla is looking to integrate a VPN directly into the browser. I'm assuming that's the same thing that we're talking about. Uh, well, it's not exactly the same thing, no, but but yes, yes. So the, yeah, they are, they are looking to do that. And, um, and, and that's kind of a big deal. Now, it's a big deal in particular. Um, now... The let me see. I'm trying to find the article here. Mozilla working on a Tor powered super private browser mode for yeah. Firefox. Yeah, that's so there was. you go. Uh, yeah, I, so this is a big deal. It's a big yeah. deal for anybody that that needs that kind of security. And by the way, increasingly, you know, with all the um, you know with everything that you hear about, you know, personal privacy, uh, you know, your your secure information being uh, opened up. Um, you, um, I'm sure you remember. Uh, was it? It was. Was it even a week ago? That uh, WhatsApp, aka uh, sorry, Facebook, yeah. announced that uh, they had uh, made available all sorts of private information to anybody on the web, like to the point that they could listen into you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, it certainly has gotten to the point and, you know, uh, we're going to, you know, kind of deviate from uh, our discussion of this article, but we did kind of mention that, uh, you know, it's it's not just criminals who use VPNs and Tor and dark web and things like that. It's just, it, it's just you know, hey, people who, uh, who and, and really journalists as well and 
parts of the in parts of the world that don't have access to open lines of communication, this is something that uh, government agencies use, uh, journalists use, everyday ordinary people use, pri you know, large corporations use. I mean, just the need for privacy is there. It's just uh, a lot of the consumer facing and a lot of the more popular options don't make it a priority. So it's good to see Mozilla taking that route because uh, hey, we get to start that conversation up again. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to I'm going to right at the bottom of the show notes. I'm going to include it right now. I'm going to and under the uh, other stuff and things right at the bottom. I'm going to put that news story. Actually, I'm going to put it in the news stories up at the top that we're sure. going to cover in just a minute there. Perfect. About uh, Mozilla um, offering a grant to uh, more more easily integrate uh, Tor into the Firefox browser. So let me just uh, put that here right now. Go for it. And uh, that way you will see it next time you load up on it. So there you go. There it is. Uh, there's a, it's, it's a link to a ZDNet article. Right. Uh, no, perfect. So uh, with that being said, but before we get into any more news, I guess we should say, uh, you have a a uh, you have a tradition of pairing, right. pairing our Linux right. with a nice wine. Sorry. Right. Pairing our pairing our <laughs> Linux topics with a nice wine. So what do you got today? Well, today I've got a Casas del Bosque. And I apologize to uh, people in Chile for uh, just totally destroying <laughs> what I'm doing there. Um, this is uh, this is something that I picked up. Um, I actually picked up a couple more bottles after I had the first one because I quite liked it. It's a um, there. There are two things I have to mention about this, which which to me are kind of fun. The first of all is that um, first of all, this is a Sauvignon Blanc. It's a 2018 Sauvignon Blanc. It's uh, it's very citrusy. It's um, kind of lemon green apple sort of flavors in it but it's it's almost got a little tiny bit of peppery spice sort of edge to it which which i find kind of nice but one of the things that i think is really kind of cool about it aside from the you know the fact that it's good it's a good and nice drinking wine mm -hmm. is that it's from casablanca casablanca is one of my favorite movies of all time i cannot tell you how many times I've, casablanca by the way you know for for you youngins out there is a movie uh starring humphrey bogart and um and uh it's from uh, what year is casablanca somebody somebody google I'm, casablanca yeah one I'll, here, right? I'll handle that one so casablanca i uh, handle that one you handle that one anyway like it's a brilliant movie it's got some fantastic lines on it including you know play it sam you played it for her you can play it for me 1942 and of course, ever popular right this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship right and 1942 oh, oh, by the way round up all usual suspects yeah, that that one too, and and you know it's one of those movies that I haven't seen, but I've seen so many times in pop culture references, uh, and you know the, at the very top of my head is a uh, 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 Family Guy likes to have these extended sequences. Essentially, before he gets on the plane and he's giving the big uh, dialogue to the woman, uh, they essentially just like redid that whole thing. So, like, <laughs> I, I I feel like I've seen it, even though I haven't seen it. But by the way, okay. 1942. All right, you. After the show is over, okay, <laughs> like I don't care what else you've got on your plate, you find Casablanca, which by the way is 1942, and it starts, like I said, uh, Humphrey Bogart, mm -hmm. and um, and I mean it's like it's like an awesome cast. Uh, I'm not going to go into the whole cast at this moment. It's not, a, but it, but it's like a fantastic movie, and it's it's just beautiful and gorgeous, and it's got it's got Nazis, and uh, I mean like just. <laughs> Everything is there, you know, uh, and you get the you get the beat up on Nazis in the movie, you right. know, uh, not in a necessarily fisticuffs way, but you know, in a in a outsmarting them and uh, showing them who's who sort of way. It's fantastic. I love Casablanca, and um, there is there is absolutely almost nothing wrong with this movie. It's just a fantastic movie. However, I, I do have to point out that Casablanca, in the case of this wine, is actually Casablanca Valley in Chile. Mm. which is not the same Casablanca as in the movie. But I still got all excited when I saw Casablanca on the bottle. So. Right. <laughs> no, and, and, and by the way, just, uh, you know, I, I know that you try to aim for like the, the $10, $15, or $20 range. Uh, you'll go high, you'll go low, you know, it, not a hard set. Yep. But is this one expensive? Uh, this one sells here in Canada for $15 a bottle. So it's not my cheapest. It's not the cheapest that I normally spend on wine. But um, so like $14, $15, I forget. It was, it was, it was like fourteen or fifteen, so it's it's one of my mid range sort right. of wine. The way I think about it, maybe on the high end of mid range. 
The most I usually spend is about 25 if it's a really, really, really special occasion. Right. So, yep, there you go. So we got our wine. Uh, You have your wine. I have my my black cherry diet soda. And we are going to go ahead and cheers and go ahead and move into what we were talking about before, news, rumors, and conspiracy theories. Uh, Yeah, you have a lot of news uh, today. So it's great to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's cover uh, let's cover a few of them. Oh, I just have to. I threw this in because I just couldn't resist how wonderful this was. I'm jumping ahead to number sure. two there. There was on the front lawn of a place in Scarborough, which is like you know down the road from where I live here. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a Starship Enterprise sitting on the lawn. This thing. So somebody drove by and took a picture of it and shared it on Twitter. And uh, somebody was asking like twelve hundred dollars for this. This uh, huge NCC 1701A, which is from the uh, from the um, um, the fourth movie, the Star, Star Trek movie, and um, it's oh, sorry, 1701A, and it is it's just like it's this beautiful big spaceship sitting on a front lawn somewhere, and then somebody came over and said, "Tell you what, I'll give you 600 for it," and he said, "Sold," and he drove away with it. Now the the subtext of the story is that. When the picture was posted on Twitter, somebody came up and I said, if you still got it, I'll offer you $35,000. So, you know, the guys that I held out for more money. But anyway, um, I just thought this was such a fun story. It has nothing to do with Linux. Well, but I, to insert some Star Trek in here, I just couldn't resist it. Shall we go back to Linux now? Well, well, well no, I, I, I'm, there, there's so much more to talk about here. Uh, 1200 bucks, <laughs> and, and for everyone out there looking at the video portion, uh, you can see there it's about the size of a pickup truck. I mean, this thing is really massive and I'm, and I'm assuming made out of metal i'm just wondering where the heck he made like did he make this and, and you mentioned that it was from the fourth movie like is this like a movie prop that he had laying around what um, no actually it was in it was hanging up in one of the uh cineplex odeon theaters in toronto um so it was actually like this big model hanging so it's a promotional prop there. yeah so it had been it had been sitting up there in the theater for however many years and I don't know. They decided to do some renovations, and they didn't want to fix it up. So they, um, they, you know, they basically said anybody who wants it can have it. And this guy picked it up and didn't really do anything with it. And after a while, decided I'm obviously not doing this thing justice. <laughs> so then he went and sold it. So uh, yeah, there's a picture there of a guy. He he went and got a big trailer and he stuck it in the back of a trailer that he hooked up to his pickup truck. So you get an idea. This is a big. This is. A, it's a big spaceship, and it's from Star Trek Four: The Undiscovered Country. So you know, it's it's um, it's just such a cool story. I just had to include it because you know. <laughs> right. Uh, well, well, and, and by the way, quick correction, just so we don't get hate mail. Star Trek Six: The The Undiscovered Country. Oh, sorry, uh, Star Trek Six. Sorry, yeah, yeah, VI, no, I, not IV. Sorry, I, yeah. I apologize. No, yeah, no we problem. will get hate mail really, really fast, and somebody's probably already saying, <laughs> "I want that guy's Star Trek fan a membership card, and I want to rip it up on the radio." It, it, it's just like movie paraphernalia is, is so collectible and something like this I'm, I'm glad that someone saw it and was like you know I'm, I'm glad that they didn't, they didn't just scrap it you know it's uh, it's going somewhere else so uh, very very cool and you're right not Linux related but still uh, geeky yeah, enough for I, just had to, I, I just sort of included in there as a joke at first as I was putting together the show notes and I thought I'm going to leave it here <laughs> Oh, perfect. And, and hey, great way to lead with. Uh, but please, uh, let's go ahead and uh, skip on over to story number one. <laughs> All right. So the the, the, um, the uh, security flaw, I've got it. Security news, a major security flaw hit, hits the Linux kernel. This isn't specifically a Linux kernel thing, but it was sort of it was sort of done that way. There is yet another Intel processor bug. Uh, and of course, it does affect, you know, a number. I mean, it affects a whole bunch of different uh, things running, obviously, Intel processors. Uh, the big news is that as soon as the information was released, there was already an updated kernel to fix the security flaw. So, so um, if you do have, however, systems that are running out there, and you should probably pay attention to this in the Windows world as well, but if you do have systems out there, do make sure that you run the updates um, on your Linux kernel, especially since this is the sort of thing that you usually don't update. I mean, people don't typically update the kernel all that much, but this is a security bug that is potentially, you know, a big deal. Um, you remember, uh, I mean, there were a couple of big ones not long ago. I'm trying to remember what they were called. There. Well, well, if you're but, talking about uh, 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 Spectrum and, and, or Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, thank you, Spectre and Meltdown. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's yet another one of these, but uh, I wanted to mention it because it is a big deal. And if uh, you know, if the people out there that are running Linux who are Linux enthusiasts, this is this is one you want to pay attention to. So do right. make sure that you download the latest kernel from your particular distribution and that you get your system patched up. Especially, especially 
if they're facing the internet, like a, you know, a web server or something. Yeah, and, and you know, hey, this actually kind of ties into what we were talking about with the Tor browser and things like that. Uh, they mentioned here in the article that the researchers were able to uh, look in real time at web pages visited through Tor browser because they're able to get it yes. through the system itself and not, you know, have to spy on any kind of network load or anything like that, or ne I'm sorry, network traffic. Um, very, very cool. But at the same time, I'm glad that they were able to patch this with software because I recall, I think it was Meltdown. Uh, that one affected every Linux uh, or every Linux, every Intel processor sold at least in the past 10 years. And that was like a hardware fix. Like there was zero way to fix that with software. Um, so I'm glad that they were able to fix this with software. Well, as it, as it turns out with Spectre and Meltdown, they were able to fix it with software, at least in the Linux kernel. Line, so. <laughs> Well, well, well. They they fixed uh, meltdown. They fixed it by turning the feature off. So everyone lost about ten to fifteen percent of their processor, uh, I, I guess, kind of power. Uh, so yeah. the only way to fix it was to turn the feature off that it was, uh, you know, making the vulnerability. So, eh, you know, fix, but at the same time, gimp. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it is an important one. So I, I do want to bring it to everybody's attention. If you're, like I said, especially if you're running. A server that's facing the internet you you want to pay attention to this update one, okay? update 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 perfect perfect, perfect. Update, so... update update absolutely um okay the next one is actually a microsoft story as you know microsoft uh in recent years has gone from thinking that uh that linux is a cancer to you know the microsoft loves linux there you go you've got the picture up there yeah. on the web page microsoft hearts linux and uh, they heart linux to the point that the next release of Windows 10, the next uh, major update of Windows 10, will include a Linux kernel. Hmm. So, so your Microsoft desktop is going to be a hybrid Microsoft Linux machine. And uh, there's some really interesting and fascinating and exciting things that are coming, like the, the Bash shell um, is going to be fully the default at that point. There is a new, uh, the article points out, if you scroll down, uh, there's a new terminal application which resembles a Linux terminal, um, like really resembles a Linux terminal. It's really kind of cool. This is going to be shipping, um, I, think, I think it's like it, the next version. I forget what the date on it is, but it's in the next couple of months or something like that. And, um, and it is going to be available. And like I said, there's going to be an actual terminal window. There you go. You've got the terminal yeah. window available there. Windows terminal app, which is going to be part uh, or available so, for people that are running Windows. Yeah, so so I I covered this a little bit. We, we tried to cover the Microsoft build event as best we could. Uh, unfortunately, it was even a little bit heady for me because uh, this is for developers. This is for you know people who are designing apps or you know working in the environment of Microsoft. So it's not really consumer facing news. But I did see that one thing that a lot of developers were excited for. Uh, I, I did not know it was because it was a full-blown Linux kernel, but I do recall covering it that uh, the terminal is getting tabs. So you can have multiple instances and do different things at the same time without having to, you know, kind of wait. So, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's, I mean, anybody who actually does any kind of work, you know, um, at the command line, like any kind of, I mean, there are a lot of developers, a lot of admins out there who are going to find this really useful. Here's the other thing that's interesting. Because of this tightly integrated Linux kernel that's coming up, virtual machines or virtualization inside Windows is going to be that much better and that much more efficient than it is right now. And this is the kind of virtualization technology they're using in the Azure cloud, for instance. So, so this is kind of a big deal. Um, and uh, there we go, June 2019, end of June 2019 is when that's going to be available. So um, it's... It's going to be interesting. I mean, more and more as time goes on, there uh, the uh, you know Windows is looking more and more like Linux as time goes on. <laughs> well, the, the, I mean, hey, that's certainly a good thing, as you know, as we've kind of seen. And on top of that, uh, I'm sure that I'm we might have talked about it last month. I'm not sure if we did. Uh, Microsoft is redoing Edge with uh, essentially the Chrome the Chromium backend, yep. which is itself Linux. So hey, uh, Microsoft, I guess you're right. They've turned the page from cancer to, you know, they're doing a lot of things right. So let's just jump on board, which is good. Yep. Yep. So you know, uh, they're they're not the evil empire anymore. That's Apple now. <laughs> It's a Apple is uh, that's a whole nother can of worms, but yeah. So uh, so yeah. yeah. So late later this year, this will be available. And overall, uh, I, I guess 
I'm gonna have to start learning how to use this. Um, and I, I've I've been kind of Just putting it off, hard. so now it's coming towards me. Uh, man. Okay, there you go. Learn to love it. Learn <laughs> to love it. You will learn to love it. All right, the next one. There's a couple of interesting things. One of them I talked about Bash, the uh, the Born shell, which is the command. You know, think of it as CMD for Linux, if you want to think about it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, if you're coming from the Windows world, a couple. I, I threw a couple of uh, GitHub pages that I thought were interesting. GitHub, which of course is now owned by Microsoft. I mean, just you know, to make this even more, uh, make this even weirder for people. Right. Um, but yeah, so you, you want to look at that one. One of them is the the bash. There's just like one liner commands, like all sorts of things you can do in one line. I found this page. I thought it was a really cool page. It gets updated on a regular basis. Um, it's just like tons and tons of useful information for somebody. Um, and of course, like I said, as more and more of the, um, you know, of the Linux kernel and, you know, the Linux, uh, shell winds up in windows. I mean, this becomes an even more interesting things for you there. So, so there, there's all these really neat, cool things that you can do with the born shell, or actually in this case, the born again shell, that's what B A S H stands for born is like the born supremacy, you know, B O U R N E. Mm -hmm. And uh, so born again shell, it's just a play on word. <laughs> I gotcha. No, a lot of commands. Okay, and, and, yeah. The next page that I've got on my list, I love this thing. Okay. I don't know about you, but I have built like I, I have had pages over the years of here's a bunch of links that are important or interesting to me in terms of staying up to date on particular bits of information, you know, like uh, just, you know, cheat sheets, um, uh, you know, how to use this command, how to do that sort of thing and so forth. And um, this thing is called the Book of Secret Knowledge. And um, it's uh, created by, uh, let me see, Trim Stray and Contributors is the way that it's listed on here. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you take a look at this thing, there is all sorts of insanely useful language for all sorts of pieces of software, primarily, obviously, open source software, but things having to do with, you know, network operations, network security, um, um, auditing tools, uh, diagnostics, debuggers, you know, like it's it's. It's this incredible list of, inc you know, insanely useful tools that's all there, like on one page that you can use. And um, this is a thing to bookmark and keep handy. It's it's just fantastic. I love this thing. It's, it's um, like I said, I've got this one bookmark. I, uh, yeah. I use it in addition to my own supremely useful bookmark. So it is definitely worth keeping on top of this one. Bookmark it's so it. weird. It's way. useful. It's so weird. Like uh, the, this Qualys SSL lab thing, uh, we had a problem with our SSL certification last week. Uh, you know, for everyone out there trying to access Computer America last Thursday, uh, you may have noticed that the HTTP version of the site was up, but the HTTPS was not. Uh, I had, for the first time ever, I had to use Qualys to test our certification. And like, I have never heard about it before, used it before. And then suddenly I'm just kind of browsing through this list and I'm like, oh, oh, hey, check that out a name that i recognize um very very comprehensive i wish you know i, I was actually looking for a subcategory that you know we're going to do more of here at computer america in the near future uh book uh not bookmarking benchmarking uh no benchmarking software unfortunately that i'm seeing here unless you know if it's there and i'm just you know not seeing it but uh this thing's massive it's uh, a yeah. lot of resources yeah, no, this this thing is fantastic. Oh, by the way, since you mentioned certificates, mm -hmm. um, I maybe I should throw this in the list as well. But if you don't already know this, there's a um, there's a certificate authority out there called Let's Encrypt. L e t s e n. That's one we use. Yeah. Yep. That's one we use. That's actually the one that we use. Yeah. Yeah. Free certificates. Free certificates. You don't have to spend the big money with your registrar for an SSL certificate. You can get them free. And in fact, if you have some sysadmin chops, you can automate the uh, the update so that you don't even, you don't ever have to touch it. So, you know, they, this whole thing about spending a hundred bucks plus a year or sometimes more, depending on how many sites that you have to handle, um, let's encrypt.org. Just, you know, right. 
great one to keep in the back of your pocket there. No, absolutely. So, uh, Marcel, I'm not sure if you can hear me because we have some problems with this, but uh, we're about to go to, to our mid-break outro, and uh, yeah, we're going to go to commercials. So, everyone, stay tuned. We'll be right back. We'll wrap up this topic, and then we'll go ahead and move on to a lot more. Everyone, Marcel Gagné, uh, all Linux show. If you want to check that out, you can, of course, uh, check out the video portion or his website. Everyone, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. More Computer America right after this. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And everyone, hey, if you missed any part of today's conversation so far, please feel free to go back and check out the podcast version of the show. It is today's show in its entirety. Uh, rebroadcast wherever podcasts are heard. And you can hear uh, myself. You can hear Marcel. And, you know, hey, time shift us. Or you can, you know, if we move too fast, you can have us on repeat. But we appreciate everyone out there listening to us live on IRN as well. Now. Okay, so we are back, and let's see. Let's go ahead and hit the button so that we can hear Marcel. That would probably be good. And, hey, we can hear Marcel again. So, Marcel, thank you for continuing on with us. Hey, that doesn't no, work. I'm here. I, I hit the I'm, button. I was, putting, I was just putting you on. I'm here. <laughs> I, I hit the button. I knew I knew that wouldn't work. So, yep. Yeah, so, uh, so, Marcel, bef uh, before we, uh, you know, so before we went to break, we were just talking about this massive list. It's huge. Um, you're right. I had a list that was probably, I want to say, like, eight to 10 websites when I was doing, you know, like a uh, kind of web development and things like that, that had resources and commands and, you know, HTML code and snippets and things like that. Uh, Eight to ten it wouldn't even begin to hold the candle to this thing. So good job to the open source community for putting this together. Yeah, it is fantastic. Anyway, so I can't believe we haven't started our, our, our featured topic for the day. Well, hey, you know, half, half the show to news, half the show to the featured topic. That seems okay with me. <laughs> All right, listen, today's featured topic is something I get into a lot these days, I have to admit. Uh, in this case, it's artificial intelligence, but specifically natural language processing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember the story. I may have mentioned it at some point, but um, there's a, an organization called OpenAI, openai.org. And um, OpenAI is an organization that's dedicated, I mean, it's, it makes money as well. It's a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. But it's um, but it it uses the resources of the open source community of the people that it hires and so forth, not only to develop artificial intelligence, but
but also to try to create some kind of roadmap so that we create um, ethical artificial intelligence, if I can use that word, uh, to make sure that it doesn't work against us, but it works for us. So it is an extremely important organization. It's one of several that I pay attention to um, in terms of the work they do. Another one is the Future of Life Institute, um, which, uh, again, is another one that I think people should be paying attention to. But one of the things that came out of OpenAI recently, um, they made a big they made a big deal about it. They talked about um, a new natural language processing technology, something called GPT, or in this case, GPT-2, which would make it the second iteration of GPT. And uh, GPT actually stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. The generative is, uh, um, I, I'm in the show notes, there's some joke there about a Star Trek episode, the ultimate <laughs> computer in the, in the original series, for anybody who remembers. Uh, the original version was not entirely successful, so this is why I worked the second one. Mm -hmm. But GPT-2, uh, generative sounds what is exactly what it sounds like. It generates text, okay? And, um, and the text is based on a predictive model, which means that they have built and fine-tuned a, a logical model of natural language that they've trained on, like basically on the internet is what it's been trained on. What's happening on the internet, including Reddit, which could be, uh, <laughs> which could be, which could be pretty we, scary. We, we saw, but, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure, the, uh, something that may spring to mind to a lot of people who were really plugged into the news feed uh, when they try to unleash an, an artificial intelligence to learn off of Twitter, it quickly became a racist hate spewing. Uh, you know, just horrible girl, or uh, was it kind of like a kind of like a, a mean girls kind of bot? Like it was uh, yeah. just yeah. yeah, yeah. It goes wrong yeah. when you let other people contribute to the source, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, it goes wrong when you let everyday ordinary people contribute to the learning material when this thing first starts out. Well, interestingly enough, one of the things that they did with this technology, with this, but with GPT two. They created a, a rather large model that generated some pretty convincing text. I included a snapshot from their mm. page there. And all you have to do is offer is give it like a small amount of text. It can be something as simple as a line from something. And I did all sorts of things. I used opening lines from novels, for instance. And the results are sometimes comical. The results are sometimes like frightfully convincing. The model that they used in here, they've got in a shocking finding, so they had a prompt that was written by somebody. Take a look at the screenshot there. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley. Keeping in mind, this is just something they made up, obviously, right. in the Andes Mountains. Anyway, the system then continues on and says, the scientists named the population after the distinctive horn Ovid's unicorn. These four horns, silver white unicorns, weren't previously, were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mysteries of what sparked this odd phenomenon is finally solved. And then it goes on and it continues to generate text, believable text. Well, yeah. In some cases. Like, like just as you know, just as very example, like it, it kind of shows that uh, the sentence is there, the the verb, and you know it, everything agrees with each other. But at the same time, it's like uh, these four horned silver white unicorns. And it's like, well, you know, unicorn, one horn, one uh, horn yeah. four, it, So, so like, uh, like, like grammatically or uh, semantically, like it, they don't really agree every time, but the sentence is there. And I think you're right. That's the scary part, uh, the cool part, the scary cool part. Well, they they were concerned about the idea that this technology could be used with the right prompt to generate all sorts of fake news and uh, and um, and uh, you know questionable content on the internet and so forth. So what they did, because part of their part of their mandate is to be open about this this development, they released a very small model, one hundred and seventeen uh, megabyte model, which is much much smaller than the final product, which I forget is like over two gigabytes in size the mm -hmm. final model anyway um and they released that so that people could play with it and learn how to work with it and so forth and i actually built this um i actually built this on my system uh, so that i could play with it and generate it now the interesting thing is about a month later or something like that they released a second model when you know for developers to experiment with and this one is 345 meg now it's still a long shot from the final two gig model uh, but it does start to give you a much better idea of what this thing is capable of 
And um, and like I've got links down here on where to find it, including where to find it on um, uh, where to find Open AI on on GitHub. So mm-hmm. I've got that in the show notes. If somebody wants to experiment with it and build it for themselves, as I did on my computer here, if you have a GPU like an NVIDIA card or something like that, with um, like an, an actual GPU as opposed to you know the cheapo built-in cards, uh, you can take advantage of that to make the system work ever faster. I see. Looking at the top there, that you link to one of the pages that I've got in the show notes called Talk to Transformer. I Talk did. Transformer.com, I believe it is. And um, this is a way, if you don't want to go through the process of building this thing, this is a way that you can experiment with it. And all you have to do is give it a, all you have to do is give it like a prompt of some sort. And uh, for instance, I just before the show started, I decided to use Snoopy's famous line, which is also from, um, uh, Edward Bulwer Lytton. So it's actually Snoopy uses somebody else's line, but it's been used as a joke in Snoopy comics. It was a dark and stormy night. It's considered the beginning of one of the worst novels ever written. Right. Oh, now it's one of the most famous novels ever written. But anyway, it was a dark and stormy night. That's all I wrote. And then the AI picks up and says, and there was nothing I loved more than being outside. <laughs> when you were 15, you had a dream that you were living in the countryside with your parents, that your parents were the best at everything. They were the best chefs in the world and so on. And so it hit me all at once in that dream, a dream that I had as a child might just happen to be a dream I had when I was 15. And that was one of the great joys of being a child, no matter how small or small time something was and on and on it goes. So it just it just picks up from whatever you give it and continues on. The results are sometimes really comical. Right. The results are sometimes a little scary. Like I use the introductory line from um, from um, uh, Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen's uh, famous novel. Of course. And um, it was like the opening line in case anybody uh, like my wife would know this off the top of her head because she loves Pride and Prejudice. It's her favorite book of all time. But here's the opening line. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. This is considered one of the most famous opening lines in all of literature. Like it's it's like it's right there with Call Me Ishmael. Anyway, I threw that into the engine and it started spouting out this weird misogynistic homophobic <laughs> rant, which was actually a little on the terrifying. It sounded like Alex Jones was talking mm. instead of Jane Austen. And it it even included fake Bible passage. Now, um, you know, I fake Bible passage that is like it included yeah. a fake Bible passage to like it invented something. It says, as the Bible says, and yeah. it's not a passage that actually exists in the Bible, but it decided to throw that in there anyway. And that actually that actually highlights one of the concerns that the open AI people had on this thing, which is that, yes, this thing could be used for malicious purposes because it could generate things that are plausible if not entirely believable you know right and it could be used to basically shower the internet with all sorts of crap and fake news and fake information to basically i mean you can do a lot of damage with this by destabilizing what people consider real information so to kind of counterbalance that uh let me introduce the the topic that i just wrote i'm not sure if you can read it on on the screen because i'm I'm, i know i'm just sharing the screen with you but for everyone out there listening exactly uh the topic or the custom prompt that i gave uh you know uh talk to transformer.com marcel gagne is computer america's linux uh, expert bringing us topics and news concerning the linux world his uh, his expertise enlightens us to the possibilities of technology that was the prompt i just thought it up off top my head marcel you're a good guy now Here's the autocomplete. Uh, picking up from the end of that, he is a member of, of the Computer Science Department of the University of Montreal, a member of the IEEE, the International Organization for Standard uh, for Standardization, and the International Commission on BSD, an independent scientific organization. He is also a member of the Linux Foundation, Open Word Foundation, and members of several other organizations. On the blog, he writes about his background in IT systems, open source security, and privacy. That's a pretty damn good summary. I'm not sure if it's all completely accurate, but it's pretty it's, darn good. It's, it's, complete, it's complete BS, but you know what? You have got to cut and paste that and send me the screenshot. <laughs> let's see. I think I can share it. I wonder if I can share it on Twitter. Uh, let's see. So 
Let's see, save image. No, just cut and, paste, cut and paste the text and send it to me in an email. That's brilliant, man. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and, and and again, like it, like it sounded good enough with credentials and accolades. It that does. man, that thing was good, right? That is, yeah, no, it, but it's scary. It actually, like, I mean, I can understand the concerns behind releasing this thing in its entirety. I totally get that because. Some of the stuff I've seen this thing generate on auto completion, like I said, some of it is comical, some of it is downright scary. In in that you, unless you actually really, really know, it could be totally legit. You know. Yeah. Um, now, the one of the reasons that you might want to build it yourself, I'll throw this out right now, is that this uh the the researcher who built this website talk to transformer.com and transformer by the way is is a um is is one of the ways to generate natural language processing uh, one of the links i give gives a whole article on that it's 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 pretty deep it's pretty complex i'm not going to go into it uh but the link is there if you want to go and read up on this but um one of the things that you get to find out if you want to build it yourself Mm -hmm. which you cannot do by using the site here is that you can actually tweak some of the parameters that it uses to generate text. Like for instance, you can give it an idea of just how complex you want the words to be. Like you can make this thing so that it sounds like it's a book written by a, you know, for a five-year-old. Like I, I dumbed it down to the point that, you know, they were like four and five word sentences, for instance, you know, using very simple words that a kid could understand. It was actually kind of fascinating to do that sometimes it it, it inserts ads for products that don't exist <laughs> you know, it's it's um it's quite fascinating and um the one of the other things that you can tweak is the randomness of the way that it generates text and so mm. so you can play with all these different settings if you decide to build it yourself whereas if you just use this page, which, which by the way, is, is pretty cool. I mean, I, I love the fact that they've put this out there. Um, it's set up for whatever defaults um, right. that uh, Adam King decided to use as his default. So there you go. Adam King, by the way, is the name of the guy who created this web page, Talk to Transformer. Right, yeah. And, and you can even see here where you can hit the button, generate another, and it comes up with a completely different one where it says you've been developing Linux for over 16 years. Uh, you know, he also serves on the board of the National Association of Computer Science. Like, Whoa! yeah, I, you, you are getting more impressive with every generation. And I like the fact that you can change, wow. you know, in, instead of it just being like an academic journal or something like that, it can it, it can change to uh, the parameters that you set. And I got to say that... Um, that's one of the scary parts because I've been kind of noticing, and I'm sure that, you know, as someone who writes articles yourself, uh, I think that to some extent, some news organizations are already doing this. Like they already kind of give a topic and they give like, like the key points and then they let artificial intelligence to some extent flesh out the article itself. And it's faster than a person. It's much more immediate. And as long as the key points are there, they really don't care. Like, I feel like the news is kind of heading this way as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, um, it's, it's really kind of cool. It's really kind of scary. There's this whole notion that, um, you know, it's like, well, certain job, we used to be told, for instance, that certain creative jobs specifically in terms of, you know, Hey, Art. writing, yeah. creating music or things like this, you know, these, these deeply creative, deeply human enterprises <laughs> is something that AI would never be able to accomplish. Well, you know what? You know, <laughs> uh, so uh, let's see. Um, Future it may not have arrived exactly, but it's knocking on the door. So, and and one last one, then we'll move on to our our distribution for the day, and we'll do that. But uh, I wanted to find, and this happened last month. I'm sure maybe it, it ties in. Uh, it's an artificial intelligence trained to make uh, death metal or or heavy metal music. Uh, it plays constantly, and I found it here. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, the people should be able to hear it. Uh, all right, well, it, it's kind of stuttering. There we go. And I can't play too much of this before it gets copyright struck, but I'm, I'm assuming that you're hearing this. It kind of has like the guttural voice, and it has that kind of thing. Anyways, it's it, it's uh it's a uh, it's streaming on YouTube. It 
it's just a 24 7 continuous loop of death metal no one ever plays anything it learned on its own and it's going non-stop like music has been created and death metal music in particular like, it's not just classical or piano music no this is like weird stuff is getting created with ai I was, I was listening to an interview with uh, an ai researcher uh, just a few days ago and uh, and i don't remember who it was i'm really sorry uh, but they were they used um, they were using uh, music that was mm. written in the style of certain classical composers, written by an AI. And then they had a person out there who considers themselves an aficionado of, of classical mm. music, and they said, "Okay, which one was written by an AI?" And the person was like practically upset on the other side. It's like I I'm going to say the first one, but I honestly don't know. And yeah. it's like, you know, they both sound like Mozart. And then the final answer was, well, neither is. They were both really? written in the style of Mozart, but neither one was original content. And it's kind of terrifying to think that all the creative styles and energies that a particular person develops over the course of a lifetime can be learned and mimicked <laughs> by a computer program. It's true. It, yeah. Last point. Last point. I swear, and then we'll move on. Uh, I, I noticed <laughs> that the people or people in the news were having a field day over it. Have you seen the Snapchat filter that turns uh, men to women, women to men? Like, it, no, it, I have not. You I have not. Oh my god. There, there's videos all over. Uh, let's see. Uh, Snapchat's uh, gender filter, I think, is what it's called. And anyone who has Snapchat can, you know, kind of go out there. But let's just pull up some images here. But like, you know, like the person on the left is a woman, person on the right uh, is through the filter and would be a man. So in turns, like, it's pretty darn good about, you know, turning uh, men to women and women to men. So, hey, you know, AI, it's a, it's a fun future. I'm glad that you decided to make it a topic for today. Well, it's, it's, increasingly, it's increasingly becoming an obsession with me. I have to admit that... Um, you know, more and more, I find myself following this stuff. And, um, and I'm not sure whether, like, I'm, there are days that I sit there and I think to myself, you know, this is how we solve the problems of the world. This is how we solve the problems because we, we need, we need intelligence that's greater than ours to deal with some of the big problems of, of society, of the world, whether it's climate change, whether it's, you know, whether it's diseases, you name it, like, you know, we need that kind of intelligence that, you know, that takes us beyond what we're capable of. But on the other hand, there's a part of me that goes like, you know, what are we doing like to ourselves? What are, what, you know, where does the line between, you know, uh, what it means to be a human being and what approximation a machine can create of a human being um, you know, where that line ends, you know, where the, where it begins, where it ends is that we just flow from one into the other. Yeah. And, um, I, I think that the question of consciousness, in other words, what does it mean to be conscious? What does it mean to be a living thinking entity is becoming more and more important as time goes on. And, um, I don't know that we're going to find out the answer before it's too late, frankly. Yeah, uh, and and one and one last point that uh, we could probably talk uh, multiple hours about this, but I gotta say that uh, when it comes to machine learning and AI, like uh, I'm sure that you know it kind of hits on this here. You can feed it information, you can feed it, uh, you know, you, you can train it, you can teach it, but really the the guts of what the program becomes after it's been trained, uh, no one can really understand it. Like people can look at the output, but they don't really understand <laughs> yes. what it is itself. So. Yeah, it, it, it's it's new territory for everyone all around. Yeah, no, it's it's exciting and it's scary all at the same time. Right. So, um, well, hey, speaking of scary, uh, we have about seven <laughs> minutes left, uh, and, and we haven't even gotten to the distribution focus. So let's go ahead and try to squeeze that one in. All right, let's try to squeeze that one in. How much time have we got? Like seven minutes. All right, all right, oh, I'll try what, to work worst really, case really worst case so scenario, worst case scenario. We'll leave uh, the final topic for another day, okay? Perfect. Oh, all yeah. right, because I had thrown something else in. We just won't get to it. Okay, um, I try to pick out different distributions. I mean, I, as you know, I switch back and forth between distributions on a regular basis. And in fact, um, I, during the time that you and I have been doing the show together, or that I've been doing the show, uh, you know, with Craig in the past, mm -hmm. like, I don't think four or five months goes by without me switching to a new distribution. <laughs> I mean, that's that's how crazy it is, and you know, on my PC. But 
But um, often what I try to do is I try to find things that are, you know, I, I mean, I do try to focus on the, the, um, the big popular ones because obviously uh, that's what most people are likely to run if they're going to run a Linux desktop. But I also try to find things that are a little bit quirky, a little bit odd and so forth. This one sort of fell in between. I had never actually thought about this being a specific operating system. It's called Pop OS. And it's made by, it's, it's a, a spin, what we call a spin or, um, you know, a rebuild of an existing distribution. In this case, it is based on Ubuntu. And in fact, it's based on the very latest Ubuntu, which was released, uh, well, we talked about it last episode, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is System76 is the company behind Pop! OS. And System76 is a big manufacturer, uh, distributor of laptops preloaded with Linux. So they're, they're, they tend to be fairly high-end laptops for developers and you know uh, people who have specific applications. And all of them are built um, to various specs and to be you know supported by System76 to run Linux perfectly, efficiently, and properly. Um, what I didn't know is that they had their own spin of the operating system, which is Pop! OS. So I decided that I would download it and I would start running it and I would try it out. In fact, I'm almost impressed enough, I have to say, to think about loading it on my own PC. I've been relatively impressed with how it works. And one of the cool things about it is when you download it, um, it does something like right off the bat, it does something which is a little bit unusual, which is it asks you what kind of graphics processor you're running. Okay. So in my case, I downloaded an NVIDIA spin because my laptop, which is a, it's a Core i5 um, Acer with 12 gig of RAM and, um, and a uh, NVIDIA GeForce with uh, 2 gig of RAM on it. Right. Um, typically, I have to go out and I have to find an NVIDIA processor and install it and then try to make it all work properly after the fact, because typically the distributions don't install the proprietary driver. OK, so you have to sort of make it work after the fact, whereas this thing, whereas their philosophy is, you know, well, we're going to make it work with your graphics processor, because obviously that's something that you're going to want to you know, this is part of what you're going to want to do with this thing. Mm -hmm. So I downloaded it. I installed it. The installation is is uh, simple and trouble-free, as you'd expect with, you know, a modern Linux distribution. It is based on GNOME, on the latest version of GNOME. And um, and in fact, I've actually been running the latest version of GNOME for the past few days, just, just on a lark. Typically, in the, ba in, in the past, I haven't done that. But I'm relatively impressed. I have to admit, I've been relatively impressed with how this has worked out lately. And um, I mean, it looks great. It's fluid. It's fast. Uh, some of the things that are included with it you are what typically you have inside your typical Linux distributions, uh, as in you'll have LibreOffice for your Office applications. Um, you'll have you know various utilities that they pick what they consider the best of for those particular utilities. Um, but by and large, it's just it's just like really nice and smooth and well put together. And like I said, I hadn't considered the possibility that a, you know, somebody who builds or, you know, sells hardware yeah. uh, for Linux would have their own spin of a Linux distribution with it. So I feel kind of stupid not having noticed this <laughs> in the past. Well, but, yeah. um, but I'm relatively impressed with what's been put together and uh, how well it works. They've got something called Pop Shop, which is a, um, a slightly modified version of... Uh, the software installer that uh, Linux has. And in fact, the, the screenshot that I've included sort of shows it, you know, as a little tiny window on the desktop there. Right. And, you know, they, they've got like, you know, the top picks, you know, the best of software that people are going to want to run. And some of those are interesting because if you take a look right off the bat, Visual Studio Code from Microsoft is in their recommended top picks. So they're very developer focused, obviously. Um, Virtual Machine Manager is right in the top of what they offer. Signal, which is an encrypted communication software. Uh, Mattermost um, and Slack are both included for, uh, for group communication. And of course, Steam, and because course if Steam. you're going to produce high end, if you're going to produce high end laptops, you got to think that people are going to play games, right? <laughs> yeah. 
No, and, and, and that's something that and I'm trying to, because uh, we have a calendar where we can search past guests. System 76, I know, has been on the show before. Uh, the problem is, I don't think they've been on the show in the past five years. So, um, maybe, you should knock on their, maybe you should knock on their door again and I, you know, see what, they, what they're up to these days. You know, I have not, there are two dealers that I think of. I, I realize Dell sells uh, notebooks with Linux pre installed. I know that. Um, but but Dell is not focused on you know on Linux. They're not focused on right. Linux, and so I, I I've always tend to think of them on you know you know on the side. Two companies that I think of right off the bat is Purism. Purism um, <laughs> is very specifically a privacy and security focused company, as in all of their stuff is built on the idea that you want to you want your life on the internet to be private and secure. So that's their big focus. Uh, System76 is a little bit more open than that because they're focused on the idea of developers, um, of people doing high-end work. And, you know, like I said, the fact that they, you know, that Steam is on their top page. Right. Um, you know, people who want a responsive and fast computer that can run games. Um, so so those are the two that I think of in terms of big companies that well, distribute Linux. And, 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 and Marcel, I, I got to be honest, we actually received an email after you covered, I, I think you were here, where we talked about uh, Puri and, uh, and their operating system and their cell phone or smartphone, I think, that uh, they, yeah. were, they were trying to put out. Uh, we actually received an email uh, after they came out with it where they, uh, you know, the listener was like, hey, are you going to do a follow-up? Are you going to invite them back on? Uh, I didn't get around to that, so I got to do that one as well. So <laughs> Purism and System76, but Marcel, I have to say, uh, we're going to play some music because, hey, we're about done for today. Um, I want to thank you so much for, you know, hey, just too much, too little time. But Marcel, yeah. if you want to give, uh, uh, you know, if people want to find out more about you, your writing, uh, your musings, where can they go? Well, I mean, uh, just start with Twitter. I'm WFTL, writer and freethinker large on Twitter. I'm also WFTL on Mastodon.social for people out there who are in the Fediverse, uh, the Federated Universe. And uh, you can also find me on YouTube. YouTube, I'm uh, Freethinker at Large, youtube.com slash Freethinker at Large. And um, actually, from either of those two places, you're going to find my websites, whether it's cookingwithlinux.com or marcelgagne.com. You'll find them both there. I'm also on Facebook. I'm, I'm everywhere. <laughs> And he's on Flipboard. Hey, no, perfect. And and of course, Marcel, I, I tweeted that autocomplete for you. Uh, I also included there in the conversation as well. But everyone, in the meantime, thank you so much for tuning in to Computer America. You can, of course, find more on our website. Until next time, everyone, have a great day. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, everyone out there. Great Linux Cheers. show. Catch you next time. Cheers. Bye, everyone. <laughs>